Thank you again so much for being here, and I want to introduce Holly Pecky, who's the literary executor of NSA Visible Life. Thanks so much. <laughs> It's a pleasure to be back at the Jefferson Market Library, where I gave a talk about NSA Vincent Malay in 2014, and again in 2015 uh, for this wonderful organization, and I too encourage you to join. Um, I talked about Malay's years in the village, 1917 to 1921. Those were the years that really defined her role as a spokesperson for the disillusioned post-war generation of youth with a poem of Fräulein Quatrain, the iconic Quatrain, I'm sure you all know, my candle burns at both ends, it will not last the night, but on my foes and on my friends it gives a lovely light. Now one of Malay's most significant relationships in the village, and I'm sure you've all heard about her well-documented love life during those years, uh, was with Floyd Dell. And Floyd Dell was a poet, a playwright, a critic, editor of Max Eastman's magazine, The Masses, the radical magazine, The Masses. Now today, it just gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Jerry Dell, whom I've known since she uh, started this book, or actually, uh, when she finished, she had finished with the book, about Floyd Dell. It's an extraordinary work because it not only uses existing material, but a thousand letters, and she'll tell you much more about this, but these were really previously undiscovered letters. So there's new information, and I know we're all gluttons for new information of all kinds, especially when it's historical. And as to what we know about these very popular, interesting, always vibrant figures from the past. Now, Jerry will talk about this bohemian love affair between Malay and Dell, but she'll also talk about another bohemian love affair, and that's the love affair that Dell had with Greenwich Village, the bohemian Greenwich Village. Jerry herself has a fascinating history. Uh, she, after a 30-year career working with illiterate women in poor countries for the World Bank, she moved to rural Pennsylvania, where she writes creative nonfiction and memoir. This book, Love Too Bright, Remembering Edna St. Vincent Millay, is a vision of the book that her grandfather was working on before he died in 1969. She's currently writing a memoir about her travels in the World Bank, with the World Bank, and another about growing up with the ghosts of Greenwich Village. So I give you Jerry Dell. Thank you very much, Chelsea, for organizing this and Holly for your kind introduction. And all of you people, I can't believe how many of you showed up. Floyd would be very pleased, as would Edna, I'm sure. Um, I also want to say what a pleasure it is to be in Greenwich Village. As we were coming in yesterday in the car, I kept saying to my husband, Terry, look, look, that's Waverly Place. That's where they lived. Oh, there's Charlton Street. Wait, wait, let's go over to Mineta. It was, for those of you who've lived here, this isn't big news, but for somebody like me, it really lives. And being in the Jefferson Memorial Library, which I assume you all know used to be the Jefferson Memorial Courthouse, Market. 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 What did I say? Well, I mean, Jefferson Market. This is the thing. I'm going to be talking from points on my little cards, and I'm probably going to get lots of things wrong, so stick with me. Um, the Jefferson Market Library, when it was a courthouse, had no small significance to Floyd Dell, and so I'll tell you more about that later. So let me have a show of hands first. How many people have heard of Edna St. Vincent Millay? <laughs> oh, how lovely. And that's why you're here, right? Good. Um, unfortunately, not as many people as we would like, those of us in this room would like, know about her out there in the rest of the world. But that's OK. We don't care about them. Now, let's think of a, sh a show of hands for how many people who are not related to him in this room have ever heard of Floyd Dell before you came to this talk? Well, I'm stunned. Maybe you're my friends. <laughs> you don't count either. You, okay. Well, I think that since fewer people do know Floyd Dell, the new and the same Vincent Millay, that it's it's uh, going to be my job here today, and maybe if you read the book, the book, 
um, you will be convinced that Boydell was worth knowing too, was worth, really well worth knowing. He was a man of many opinions, and they weren't uh, always appreciated by everybody, sometimes very controversial opinions. And he was um, very con contradictory opinions about many things, <coughs> including, but not limited, to Edna Millay. One thing about Floyd is that these letters in this book that you're reading, will be reading, um, he wrote them all in the last 10 years of his life. So he's a very old man. He hadn't forgotten a thing. A lot of older people forget. He didn't. And they also become more conservative with time. And he didn't. So that sort of was interesting. I knew him, I knew him because, as um, I think we talked earlier, he died in 1969. And so growing up with my grandparents in Washington, D.C., I knew him until I graduated from high school. So I knew him as an old man. This whole story comes before my time. So just to give you the facts, Floyd Dell was born in 1887 in Barry, Illinois. He grew up in Davenport, Iowa, and he was in a very, very poor family. He had to leave school at uh, the age of 15 or 16 to work in a factory. He was terrible at working at a factory, and so he joined the Socialist Party to feel better about things. Uh, then he, he went trying to get a job. He couldn't work at a candy factory anymore. He went down the road, and he looked, and he saw a sign saying, sweeper needed. And the sweeper was going to be the sweeper in the local journal, the local newspaper. They needed somebody to sweep the floors, so he took the job. Well, out of nowhere, somebody said, we have an assignment, it's a human interest story, can somebody go? And he went, the sweeper, went off and became a cub reporter that very day. This is in Davenport. As most of the young Midwestern uh, boys wanted to do, he eventually found his way to Chicago in 1908, where he lived for four years and was the literary editor for the Chicago Evening Post. In particular, the Friday Literary Review which for those of you who know a little bit um, about that period and will know that the Chicago uh, literary renaissance uh, came around that time and, and he was responsible in large part for bringing to the attention of the reading public people such as Theodore Geiser and uh, Sherwood Anderson and Carl Sandburg, uh, Rachel Lindsay, <coughs> Jack London. So then, Having spent four years in Chicago, growing up a little bit, he came to New York City in 1912. And in fairness, he had really grown up a bit. He had already written a book called Women as World Builders. Now, my grandfather was a feminist in 1914. Think about that. Where is he now? Um, the year he met Malay in 1917, he was, that's when they shut down the Omasis magazine which we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, but he lived a long life, and he died in 1969 at the age of 82. Edna St. Vincent Millay was born in 1892 in Rockland, Maine. She was one of three sisters. She was also extremely poor, and she probably wouldn't have gone to college either, except that she had a benefactress who had heard her read her poem, Renaissance, and was just knocked out by her and said, this girl has to go to college. And she went to Vassar for four years. And in 1917, she left Vassar and she came to Greenwich Village. So that's all very exciting. We're very glad she did. As for me, I was born the year after Malay died. So she didn't live as long a life as Floyd did. She only lived to be 58. And uh, I always felt her presence in my life. Both her poetry, which I recited and memorized as a small child, and the stories that Floyd told us about her all the years I was growing up. So Blood Too Bright uh, began with a trip I took to Chicago six years ago to do family research. And I wasn't actually going to find Floyd at all, although the Newberry Library in, um, in Chicago is where his papers are kept, and that's why I went out there. There are 11 linear feet of boxes of Floyd Dell papers in Chicago, if you're ever interested. And uh, I didn't go there to find Floyd, though. I was going there to find my grandmother, Dee Marie, Dee Marie Gage, 
who didn't write her stories down. She told stories, and I hoped I would be able to find something about her in those papers. In fact, you can imagine my surprise when instead I found <coughs> 1,000 handwritten pages of letters that Lloyd Dell had written about Edna St. Vincent Millay. Well, you can imagine, I had rather mixed feelings about this. My first thought was, so that is what he's been doing. All those 10 years that he was behind those closed doors, writing away, writing away, he was writing about Edna St. Vincent Millay. On the other hand, I thought, what the heck was that about? He had this wonderful grandmother of mine, married to her for 50 years, he had no business writing those letters. <laughs> However, in the letters, when I, was <clears throat> when I was reading the letters, I found out that he intended to publish these letters. And with, the, with Miriam Gurkha, who is the recipient of these letters, they were going to publish them back in the 60s. And for reasons I can tell you some other time, if you would like to ask in the question and answer period, they didn't publish them. They left them for me to publish 50 years later. So, as Holly said, this is my version, Blood Too Bright is my version of the book that Floyd never actually wrote, but most of the words inside it are his very own words. So let me take you back to Greenwich Village again, a trip back to America in the 1910s, in the post-Victorian period and during, just before and during the First World War. It seems that as New York expanded hugely northward, this fashionable 19th century residence district was deserted and left to decay into a picturesque 20th century slum in which only the north side of Washington Square still held its head above the mire. And this slum, for economic reasons, became increasingly the home of artists and writers. He has snippets of poetry throughout this, so I will read this one. There was a Greenwich village then, a refuge for tormented men whose heads were full of dreams, whose hands were weak to do the world's commands, builders of palaces on sands. These needful of a place to sleep came here because the rents were cheap. <laughs> now my observation is that the rents aren't still really very cheap. <laughs> But maybe there are still some tormented men and women <laughs> living in the village. And I think it's certainly a place where free thinking and, uh, and imagination and creativity run wild. So Floyd loved many, many things about the village. And so I thought I'd, I'd take my own little walk around his Green, uh, Bohemian Greenwich Village, where at 137 McDougal Street, I'm sorry to report that New York University has taken up a lot of my addresses here. But imagine, if you will, that there is 137 uh, McDougal Street, and upstairs is the Liberal Club. And the Liberal Club is where many interesting people, like Margaret Sanger, came to talk about birth control and um, the IWW, you know, about labor rights. And Freud was being talked about by everybody. Um, and Floyd and his friends would go to these talks in the evenings at the Liberal Club, and then they'd come downstairs into the basement. And in the basement, they'd go to Polly's Restaurant. And Polly's Restaurant was run by Hippolyte Pam Pavel and Polly Holiday, who were both anarchists. Lucky for them, because they never charged them anything for the food. <laughs> and I don't know how they did it, but they didn't charge them for the food, so they stayed up all night talking and drinking, having a fine time. Then we have at 91 Greenwich Avenue, the, that, that building still stands, I think, 91 Greenwich. It was where the old Masses Magazine was located. That was the site of the Masses Magazine, where Floyd was the managing editor. Um, and on the masthead of that magazine, without getting into too many details about it yet, here is what it said it stood for. Fun, truth, beauty, realism, freedom, Peace, feminism, and revolution. <laughs> How about that? You can see why the government shut it down. Um, now, there was also, oh, I should mention a couple of other places. There was the Webster Hall, 
There's Webster Hall is still here, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, good. I'm so relieved. But the back when they were going to Webster Hall, they did something called a pagan rout. And they were raising money. They did this to actually raise money for their Masses magazine, which is a socialist magazine, but they still needed money. And so they all got dressed in costumes and had masquerade balls at Webster Hall. And then every now and again, they had some money. And they would take themselves out to dinner at the Brevoort Hotel, which was at 19th Street and 5th Avenue. Do you, is this the Brevoort still there? Ninth. Ninth. I typed that in the is it still there? No. 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 You see, this happens to me all the time. Okay. The door that yeah. was moved to a restaurant called Vessels. The door. The door from the hotel. Oh, that's, really? That's gone now, too. But that was there for several years, very recently. Really? OK. So well, we'll just imagine. If you read this book, it'll all come back to you. OK. So then there was the Provincetown Playhouse. And I was pleased to see Oops. I don't bother about this. As you can tell, I have an outdoor voice. Um, the Provincetown Playhouse at 133 McDougal Street. And Floyd was one of the founders of this experimental theater back when it was still in Provincetown. Um, and it migrated to Greenwich Village. And he wrote and produced several one-act plays for the Provincetown players. In 1917, he held auditions Sorry for the part of Annabelle. And Annabelle was the leading lady in his, his uh, play, An Angel Intrudes. And this is what he had to say about the girl who came to audition for the role of Annabelle. A slender little girl with red gold hair came and read Annabelle's lines. She looked her part to perfection and read the lines so winningly that she was at once engaged. She left her name and address as she was departing. And when she was gone, we read the name and were puzzled, for it was Edna Millay. We wondered if it was possible, possibly Edna St. Vincent Millay, the author of that beautiful and astonishing poem, Renaissance, which just this year was published in a volume of her poems under that title. And indeed, it was. Well, so it began in December 1917. The affair between Edna St. Vincent Millay and Floyd Dell that clearly Floyd Dell never forgot. There was so much about Edna St. Vincent Millay that inspired passion in people, all kinds. It took many forms. Floyd, in particular, just loved her strong will and her courage. And in the book, there is a uh, one of the sections is a profile he did of Edna St. Vincent Millay in the Herald Tribune in 1931. And it was a very flattering, uh, a lot more flattering, this particular profile than some of the things that came later. But he talked about her at a time when most people knew something about her, but he knew more about her than they did. She tells this anecdote. Once Edna Millay swam out on an unfamiliar neighboring beach toward, this is when she was a girl, and he's telling the story, a, a little bit of a biography, how she had gone swimming out to what she thought was a green island, and had to swim a long way, and with tremendous effort, she reached the lovely green island, and it wasn't an island. It was just a mass of floating seaweed with no foothold. Now her strength was all gone. And it was only with a courage of despair that she swam back. Her tired body wanted only rest, and each stroke was a long agony. But her will drove her on, and courage brought her home. Then, at the end of that same, at the end of that same section, and the, the end of the Herald Tribune article, he writes, I have not yet said what anyone who is a friend of Edna Millay feels about her. Perhaps it can only be said in poetry. To know her is to write poetry to her and about her, and a great deal of poetry has been written. In poetry better than in prose, one can speak of the God walking our mortal plane, of the lost child, of the good comrade. One feels for Edna Millay a strange mingling of awe and tenderness. No, it cannot be said in prose. There is too much magic in it. But, and there is a but, she was a great love poet, people
people loved her tremendously, and she was not always easy to love. In this book, you see, particularly in his letters, when he's talking later, as he remembers back to the way she treated him, um, one of the things that was hardest about loving her was that she would not be truly known by anyone. And at one point, because he was Freudian and always wanting to analyze things, he was asking questions, and she said, you ask too many questions, Floyd. There are doors in my mi mind that you must not try to open. Well, that was true. And the other thing, and there was the second thing, which is this is not a woman who could be faithful to just one man. Floyd had a little bit too much jealousy for her. And uh, I could give you just the first few lines of one of her sonnets that he thinks was for him. I shall forget you presently, my dear. So make the most of this, your little day. Your little month, your little half a year, ere I forget, or die, or move away. Not an easy woman to love. The third thing that really made it hard for him was that she was always on the verge of disappearing. I mean, you don't want a girl who's constantly playing to vanish on you. And she wrote a poem about that, too. It's called Daphne. Why do you follow me? Any moment I can be nothing but a laurel tree. Any moment of the chase, I can leave you in my place a pink bough for your embrace. Yet if over hill and hollow, still it is your will to follow, I am off to heal Apollo. <laughs> now, in addition to loving her, I think Floyd in particular respected her in so many ways. There was the poetry, which he goes on about, but there was also a political side to Edna Molay that I don't think most people really identify with her tremendously. <coughs> in the book, he talks about what he calls two revolutionary movements with which he identifies her. And he said the first one is feminism. She came to it a little bit later than some because she, the fight for, the, for women's vote had been going on quite a while by the time she came. But she was all about political freedom, to work, to love, and as well as the vote. And unfortunately, from Floyd's point of view, too much was expected of the vote for women, too much was expected of sexual freedom for women, and that the world he was living in was pretty disillusioned about these things. On the other hand, Edna St. Vincent Millay was not disillusioned at all. She liked free love very, very much. And she was unrepentant in it. Those of you who, I think I have it here, I just happen to have some swag. <laughs> what lips my lips have kissed, and where and why, I have forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> so she really, really knew what she wanted to do in life, and it didn't involve staying home, having children, making lunch. <laughs> then there was the issue of war and peace. And when she was first in the village, it was all about being a pacifist, because it was the first World War. Um, but as time went on, and during the Spanish Civil War, she watched what happened when the fascists <clears throat> took over. And she wrote a poem called, Say You've, Say That You have seen Spain die. It's a very powerful poem. <clears throat> and then as she started seeing the Nazis, long before the, the US administration and the American people were ready to get us into the war, she was ready to get us into the war and fight the Nazis. And she wrote a book, uh, she wrote a poem called Apostrophe to Man. And it's pretty, <clears throat> pretty hard to take, but it's also it was very, very powerful stuff. This being said, there were a lot of people who were very resentful that she stopped writing love poets, poet, uh, poems and started writing <coughs> political poems. Floyd was one of her greatest defenders in that. Someone who was not ready to defend her was Ezra Pound. You'll see in this book, Ezra Pound is one of the villains. <laughs> um, there were some reasons for that, of course. Floyd didn't like modernism. And so uh, T.S. Eliot and Ezra Pound represented some kind of poetry he didn't like. But he felt Ezra Pound couldn't stand Millay because she was a woman, she was a love poet, and she was popular. She was more popular than any other poet, including Ezra Pound. 
And people came from miles around to hear her recite poetry, and he thought that her poetry couldn't be very good just on those grounds alone. Well, Floyd's view is that when um, Ezra Pound started accusing her of propaganda, it's all propaganda, uh, that it was because he, Ezra Pound, was fascist. And I think that's true, I think mean, that's been proven, that he was very pro-Nazi. And so he just had one more nail in the coffin of Edna Millay that he hammered on in there. But it hurt her. I mean, it really, she took very seriously people's criticism of her poetry. That said, I want to read an inscription in her book, which is Make Bright the Arrows. I don't have it here, but it's the volume that came out in 1940 of these poems. And it says, Dear Floyd, don't be a critic of poetry when you read this book. Just be a reporter of human reactions, except in the case of the good poems, and there are some. <laughs> <coughs> they parted ways. Floyd and Edna Millay stayed together as lovers probably just a little over a year. And Floyd knew her husband, Ed, Eugene uh, Ozeben, very well. When uh, they met, Floyd was there when they fell in love. Floyd was always there when she was falling in love with another man. It wasn't so easy for him. He didn't handle that terribly well. But Malay, after they split up, remained a free spirit. She was married to Eugene for 25 years, which never stood in the way of her love life. She had her own little place that she could be. And Eugene was very open-minded and cooked very well. <laughs> and didn't insist she had children and made it possible for her to spend all her time writing poetry and plays. So she wrote five plays and she had 15 books of poetry, including the Pulitzer Prize winning book in 1923. She enchanted people with her readings and made, made uh, poetry so popular. Even if Floyd may be a little excessive, he was, you know, a little excessive in saying she was the best poet to ever write in the English language. Maybe some of you feel that way. <laughs> Maybe not. Um, but she, Richard Wilbur, the, a contemporary poet, has said that Millay wrote some of the greatest sonnets ever written in the 20th century. And I think that's fair. Meanwhile, Floyd was married. Floyd married in 1919. He married my grandmother, Marie Gage. They stayed to married for 50 years. They wrote 20 books. He wrote. He wrote 20 books and raised two sons. He worked for FDR's New Deal with the WPA, and he infused his granddaughters' lives with the spirit of Greenwich Village and the poetry of Edna St. Vincent Millay. Now, I mentioned earlier that Ezra Pound tore Millay limb from limb, and that Floyd was her defender and particularly thought it was appropriate that she should write um, poetry about such things as politics that they matter to him. But she, and this is, has to do with the title of this book, I would like to read the last stanza of a poem, which is in Second April, her collection Second April, and it's called Weeds. This is the poem, the last stanza. And here a while where no wind brings, the baying of a pack of furs. May sleep the sleep of blessed things, the blood too bright, the brow of hers. Lloyd, in his, he thought he, this was sort of a, an epitaph that she was writing to herself uh, or about herself. And um, he says it is something like an epitaph that she writes on herself, the blood too bright, the brow of hers. Yes, the blood was too bright that flowed in her poetry, too bright and impulsive for a time that was sinking into the chlorotic pow pallor of T.S. Eliot. <laughs> Did I say he had opinions? Um, the brow that held her rebellious thoughts was accursed by all our standards of respectability, yet she triumphed for a time as a symbol of beauty and rebellion and she will come to triumph again. So, taking it back to me again, I was off in Chicago, as I tell you, in 2010, looking for my grandmother, 
and finding in the St. Vincent Millay instead. And rather than be too furious, I just kept reading the letters. And I found in one of the letters this paragraph. I can remember in the spring of 1919 taking Bee Marie, my brand new wife, to call on the Malays, and Edna upstairs taking, as it seemed, hours to dress. She came down the stairs at last, stately in a velvet gown, more suitable to a recital than this occasion, or so I thought. Bee Marie was then, and always, an, admirer, an ardent admirer of Edna Millay. Her poetry, as well as her person, Edna got along with B. Marie very well. B. Marie was also an ardent feminist and pacifist, although her feminism, I am happy to say, didn't go to such extremes as Edna's. <laughs> so when I read that, I thought about B. Marie and how understanding she was. <clears throat> and then I remember being about seven years old and in the house in Washington, D.C., where I spent lots of time with my grandparents, B. Marie was working away, piling all kinds of papers and boxes. And there were all kinds of spiral notebooks and every, and put twine around them. And I asked her, what are, what are you doing? Why are you putting all these papers in boxes? And she says, this is our gift to you. I said, why are you closing them up? We're going to take them to the post office. And we're going to mail them to Chicago. And the Newberry Library is going to take care of these papers until you grow up. <coughs> and when you grow up, you'll go there and you'll find all these papers and you'll know who your grandfather was. So I got there. I found out what she had been putting in those boxes and what was it? It included a memoir about Floyd's relationship with Innocent Vincent Millay and a thousand letters about it. This was something B did, not, not Floyd. Floyd didn't mail those letters for posterity. My grandmother did. I also remembered a, a time when I was quite young, we were having a big dinner party, and my grandfather did what he always did, which he, he proclaimed the glories of innocent and Malay, and read a poetry. And everybody was listening carefully, and I heard my grandmother B next to me saying, It's a whole different perspective on Edna St. Vincent Millay, that she wasn't jealous, she felt compassion for her, and she indulged my grandfather, why? Because he was a romantic, she liked that. He was unconventional, she liked that. He was a literary man who had, for a time, Edna Millay in love with him. He was influential in, as a man of letters. She didn't begrudge him Edna Millay at all. She was more than happy to have her be in the family, which is the way it felt like, and both of them loved the way. And I did too. And this is something I think you all need to know. You see this book, this tattered orange book? It is in the St. Vincent Millay's poem selected for young people. And this is the same book I've had since I was five years old, when I started memorizing poems. And just to give you an example, because it's been a few years, Come along in then, little girl, or else stay out. And in the open door she stands and bites her lips and twists her hands and stares upon me, trouble-eyed. Mother, she said, I can't decide. I can't decide. <laughs> Look, Edwin, do you see that boy talking to the other boy? No, over there by those two men. Don't look now. No, look again. Not the one in the navy blue. That's the one he's talking to. Sure you see him. Striped pants. He was born in Paris, France. <laughs> I went to Paris later. I, I think that may have had something to do with it. Um, but then there was this other side of MMLA that I came to know much better when I was much older, which was Fatal Interview. It was a series of sonnets in a book called Fatal Interview. <coughs> and it was a different tone altogether. This beast's that rends me in the sight of all, this love, this longing, this oblivious thing, that has me under as the last leaves fall, 
Will blood, will sicken, will be gone by spring. Of course, the one that Holly mentioned, the one that we all know about the candle and the two ends and all of that, I was listening to Carolyn Kennedy on uh, an interview she had, and she was asked, we all know Carolyn Kennedy, right? She was asked what was the first poem she ever learned by heart. Because she'd just written a book about poems for children to learn by heart. And she said, safe upon the solid rock, the ugly houses stand. Come and see my shining palace, built upon the sand. When I was growing up, my dad had put that first fig, second fig of Millet's into music. And he, I learned yesterday, with Kate, he called it JFK when it was a song. The song was JFK, and it was because it was John Fitzgerald Kennedy's favorite poem. And uh, the thing was, I thought my father had written it. <laughs> <laughs> it took me a while to realize that he hadn't written it. He had just written the music for it. Um, now I'm going to bring us back to the Jefferson Market Courthouse and the Masses Magazine because the Masses Magazine had been doing things that they felt were perfectly fine, but the federal government did not. And one of the things that Floyd did was he wrote an essay about conscientious objection, right? He was a pacifist. They were all, the, the editors at that time were all pacifists. And there were a lot of satirical <laughs> cartoons by Art, Art um, Young. And they had, for example, one of them had a young boy being put into a cannon as far for the First World War, and the federal government didn't like that one bit. So they put the editors of the, Ma the, the Masses magazine on trial for sedition in 1917, and they got a hung jury. They did it again in 1918. And let me read you what Floyd says about that. The weeks passed and we found that there was to be a second Masses trial, a new and tremendous effort to send the Masses editors to prison. The trial had just begun when Edna came to see me and saw that I was again in danger and her place was at my side. She was my companion all through the trial. While the jury was out deliberating about whether to send me to prison, she walked the corridors with me, reciting her new poems. These corridors, this is where she walked with him. Now, in addition to Blood to Bright, which is what I'm usually quoting from, there is a book of stories which um, is Floyd wrote in 1925 called Love in Greenwich Village. I think those of you who live in Greenwich Village would be interested to know that the first story in this book is The Rise of Greenwich Village. The last story in this book is The Fall of Greenwich Village. <laughs> so the village is dead, long of the village. Let me read you a little bit about the, des the description that he gives because it was the last place that he lived in the village before he moved away with my grandmother. And it was a place on Christopher Street. It was 11 Christopher Street. And in 1921, he was in France, and he heard from one of the friends in the village that they had torn it down, that that building that he had lived in so happily was gone. And so he wrote an extremely long poem I will not read you the whole poem, it's much too long. But I'll just give you, it's called The Ballad of Christopher Street. And I'll describe a little bit what happened, what he described the apartment to look like. A painted cupboard on the wall, colored cups and dishes, tulip garden crockery to match our happiest wishes, a Japanese print and a candlestick with candles burning bright, curtain folds of sunny gold at windows left and right. A couch with tap patterned tapestry, a cigarette-scarred table, a view from either window of an alley and a stable, ashtrays scattered round about in all the likely nooks, and everywhere on shelf and chair. Books, books, books. <laughs> that actually 
actually describes most of the houses I ever lived with, the devils as well. So at the very end, and I'm just skipping now, I'll just read you how this ballad ends. It stands no more in the sight of men, in the traffic's war and beat, the little rickety house of ours where life was young and sweet. There's nothing left but an empty lot and a stray board and brick, and you've the Japanese print, my dear, and I the candlestick. The world is wide with many a path that's pleasant to the feet, but none that will ever turn back again to 11 Christopher Street. Mm -hmm. Time has triumphed and Earth's deep dust has claimed its ancient right to be enriched with our memories of laughter and delight. There's nothing to do, there's nothing to say, except that life was sweet to a boy and a girl for a year and a day at 11 Christopher Street. <laughs> I want you to know that I did a Google search and 11 Christopher Street is 466 feet from where we're sitting now, <laughs> which I thought was nice. Thank you very, very much. Um,